News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, The Hollywood Murders. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Hollywood, not far from Belfast in Ireland, and it is 1873. Miss Kerr, an elderly spinster in her seventies, and her servant, Jane Toner, are found bludgeoned, each in a most horrific way. The house has been ransacked, and there are empty bottles of alcohol throughout the house, and the murderer, or murderers, felt comfortable enough to have a sleep after the murders for an early morning getaway with goods. The ransack included the shoes of bludgeoned Jane, the fifty-year-old maid. Through unswerving and determined police work, the police managed to track down what turns out to be killer sisters. A double homicide in the quiet suburb of Hollywood in Ireland is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. Before you begin, we would like to ask if you like the show to please like and subscribe to our channel. We are a small channel, but with a dedicated and passionate team. If you can support our channel, we would be very grateful. Thank you. In the early morning of the 30th of December, 1872, the milk cart goes by for the morning delivery of the milk. The driver has his daughter with him as he drives the cart. The daughter drops off the morning milk on the doorstep of Croft Lodge, giving a discreet knock at the door, as usual for the maid to open the door and collect it. There is no response. The little girl knocks louder, but there is still no response. Thinking that possibly the maid is busy elsewhere or sleeping in, the the milk cart trundles on its way for the remainder of the morning deliveries. Upon the cart's return back, the milk on the doorstep of Croft's Lodge has still not been collected, and it is now around ten in the morning. Knowing that something is wrong, the little girl knocks again and then goes around to one of the windows where she sees a brutal scene of blood and gore. Shocking murder of a lady and her servant. Yesterday, a double murder of almost unheard of atrocity was discovered to have been perpetrated in Hollywood, on the persons of an old lady named Miss Kerr and Jane Toner, her servant. From the time of the discovery of the fearful tragedy, the utmost consternation has prevailed in the town, and a strong feeling of indignation has been aroused against the perpetrators of the horrid crime. This feeling has been intensified from the fact that the reputation of Hollywood has hitherto been unstained by crimes of such a diabolical and outrageous character. The lady who was to all appearances the first victim of the murderers, resides at Croft Lodge on the Victoria Road, High Hollywood, and, with the exception of the servant who has met the same awful end, she has no companions in the house. Discovery of the Body The murder was discovered in the following way. At eight o'clock, Yesterday morning, a little girl named Mary Walsh went to the house and, in accordance with the usual custom, left a can of milk on the doorstep and then went away after ringing the bell to call the attention of the inmates of the house. On returning at about ten o'clock, she found that the can was untouched and went to the rear of the dwelling and, looking in at one of the windows, observed one of the victims lying dead. She immediately gave the alarm, and a man named George Lennox, who was passing, 
came over at her request and looked in at the window. The door, which was found to be fastened, was broken open by Sub-Constable Macruden, when a fearful spectacle met his view. Lying inside an inner glass door, and at the top of the stair leading from the basement floor, was the lifeless body of Jane Toner, the servant woman, her feet extended towards the door, and her head resting in a small pool of blood. She had evidently been attacked from behind, the blows having been given with such violence as at once to stun and kill her. The Scene of the Crime The house presented a scene of the greatest disorder, articles of furniture and household goods lying about in confusion. The police then descended to the basement floor, and on the floor of the kitchen they found a large pool of blood and stains of blood upon the walls. They then entered a small pantry, which opens off the kitchen, and in it, covered with an ironing blanket and an old bed quilt, was the body of the murdered lady. She was lying on the ground, the head towards the door, and the feet drawn inwards under a shelf. Unknown Women Visitors Mrs. McAllister, the wife of the Reverend Mr. McAllister, the Unitarian clergyman whose ministrations the deceased lady attended, stated that on Sunday afternoon she called on Miss Kerr, who complained to her that she was greatly annoyed by the servant having two strange women in a bedroom downstairs drinking. They had been in the house on Saturday night, but had gone away after the servant had been spoken to and seemingly returned on the following day. These women are doubtless the authors of this atrocious crime, and the state in which the interior of the house was found points to plunder as to the motive to the perpetration of the outrage. The Murders The old lady appears to have been dragged by the united strength of the two women, probably assisted by the servant, towards the kitchen where the foul deed was consummated. The mat on the outside of the kitchen door bears traces of blood, and inside, in the centre of the floor, is a pool of blood, which had flowed from the victim after she had been felled to the ground by some fearful blows. Terrible force would seem to have been used in the execution of the murderous work, for the walls on each side, some feet off, were splattered with blood, and the murderers must also have been stained with gore. The body most likely remained on the floor sufficiently long for the flow of blood from the wounds to cease, but there is no sign of it having dropped on the floor whilst the body was being removed out of sight. Afterwards, it too was removed to the place in the pantry where it was found. The ferocity of the murder is rendered apparent from the fact that the blows were on the face and forehead, the features being smashed and beaten into a shapeless and bloody mass, frightful to look at. The weapon with which the deed was done was found upstairs beside the body of the servant. It is an iron salamander used when brought to a red heat for kindling fires in bedrooms. It is about a foot and a half in length of wrought iron and weighs about five and a half pounds. Plunder. The furniture in the drawing room has been pulled about, drawers burst open, and boxes which might be supposed to contain money, jewels, or plate were broken into. Goods of all kinds were lying about in confusion. In one corner, a heap of clothes, in another, an overturned chair, evidence of a reckless and hurried search. 
In the hall, leading from the front door, a cabinet was forced open and rummaged. Surrounding the body of the servant were bottles and jars, which had been tossed about by the predators. Besides her head was a bottle containing about half a glass of whiskey. Near the feet was a bottle which had contained gin, and at some little distance was another which had held porter. Simultaneous with the work of searching the house, the perpetrators of the outrage seemed to have engaged in a carouse, which must have left them in a condition at least of semi-intoxication. The maid. She was lying on her back, her left arm being stretched out, and the right crossed over the breast, and the hand firmly clenched. The face has a calm expression, and bears no trace such as might be left by terror or protracted agony. This would indicate that her death must have been rapidly and effectively executed. Beside her body there was also a smoothing iron, which may have been used as an instrument of offence in attacking the unfortunate creature. The second act of this appalling tragedy seems to have closed with the death of the servant as first did with the death of the mistress, and then the two she-demons, worn out by their dreadful work, appear to have gone upstairs and gone to bed in a large, unoccupied bedroom. Sleeping in the Murder House This bedroom was in a similarly confused state as the other rooms, the washstand occupying the centre of the room and the greatest disorder being manifest. The bed in the further corner is tossed as if recently occupied, and everything seems to indicate that the occupants were in a drunken or maudlin state. The liquor taken evidently rendered one of them sick, as on the floor beside the bed bears traces of someone having vomited during the night. The hour at which the murder took place is surmised from the circumstance that in the pantry in which the body of Miss Kerr was found, there was a tea tray containing cups and saucers and a cream teapot, the latter of which was full and all ready, as if for the tea or supper for the deceased lady. The crime is, therefore, thought to have been committed on Sunday evening, as Miss Kerr had partaken of her last meal for the day. Two women. The first trace discovered of the murderers was at the commencement of their flight from the house yesterday morning. William John Graham, the postman, on coming out from Glenside, the residence of the Reverend Mr. Henderson, observed two women from the direction of the gate of Croft Lodge, each carrying a bundle. This was about a quarter past eight o'clock in the morning. The description he gives of the woman is that the taller one was dark, round features, black waved hair, and carried something on her shoulder, concealed under a fold of her dress. The petticoat she wore was exposed and was red and white coloured. The other woman who accompanied her was wrapped in a waterproof cloak and wore a red bonnet with red trimmings. Graham, the postman, spoke to them, and while he did so, the lesser one stopped down as if to lace her boot, and hid her face in her dress, apparently to prevent it being seen. They then quickened their pace when the postman remarked that they needn't be running away so quickly as he was not going to hurt them. But instead of stopping or slackening their speed, they amended their pace and went off faster than before. After passing Glenside, they crossed at Riverdale, close beside the house of the Reverend Mr. Murphy, to the church road, their object seemingly being to reach the road 
leading to Belfast by making a detour through the outskirt instead of going through the town. At the west end of the town, opposite Dr. Dunlop's, they came up with a carter, whom they accosted, and they asked him to assist them in reaching Belfast if he was going there. He replied that he was, and consented to let them accompany him. The murders are a true shock for the small community, and it is stated how often and how well respected Miss Kerr had been. The police scour Belfast, where it is believed that the two women got transport to. Within days, the police have retrieved their first suspect. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 1st of January, 1873, The Hollywood Tragedy and the Arrest of a Woman in Hollywood. In Hollywood, an arrest was made of a young woman named Mary Raw, employed in the capacity of cook by Mr. O'Reilly Blackwood. It appears that when the rumour spread abroad that the woman whom the young man Wallace conveyed to Belfast in his cart were probably the guilty parties, information was conveyed to the police barracks that a little girl had identified the smaller of the women as Mary Raw, and as the one who gave her a sixpence to go into Hollywood for a car. The appearance of the accused, Mary Raw, the young woman who has been arrested on suspicion of having been one of the perpetrators of the barbarous double murder of Miss Kerr and her servant, is apparently about thirty years of age and is by no means of a forbidding aspect. She is an ordinary-sized female, has sharp, well-defined features, is dark-complexioned and has jet-black hair and eyes. Her hair is brushed back from her brow, and she moves about in a restless manner. She seems to be intelligent and quick of perception, and maintains a confident air, which might also be described as defiant. From the composure of her demeanour, one would imagine that she did not appreciate the gravity of the situation in which she is placed. Indignation of the populace. During the sitting of the court, the petty sessions room was thronged, and a considerable crowd hung about the precincts of the building. When the proceedings were adjourned, the room was cleared, but a large number of persons remained for the purpose of getting a glimpse of the unfortunate accused, and on her emerging between a couple of constables and ascending a car, shouts and jeers were indulged in by the people, and were continued on the way to the police barracks, the car being followed by a clamorous mob. The movements of the two women suspects could be traced with witnesses from their departure of Croft Lodge in the early morning of the 31st, carrying bundles of goods wrapped in white linen out of the house. They had given some money to a little girl to get them a cab. They had been seen and spoken to by the postman. They had been given a lift in a cart to Belfast, where they had taken a cab. All of the witnesses were quite clear as to their appearance. Mary, who has been caught, is recognised as having worked in Hollywood previously. Whilst the police search in vain for the second suspect, the autopsies of the bodies taken place. The wounds are horrific in nature. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 1st of January, 1873, The Hollywood Tragedy. The important discovery was made that the original hypothesis was undoubtedly correct, and that the servant girl, Jane Toner, as well as her mistress, had been brutally murdered. On the body being moved, it was seen that she had received 
one or more blows on the back of the head, and the medical gentleman pronounced that the red matter, which on the previous evening was surmised to be wine that had been thrown off the stomach, was in fact human blood. The supposition that the servant, after having assisted in the robbery and, perhaps in the murder of her mistress, had died from a surfeit of liquor was therefore altogether erroneous, and there now seems no ground to doubt that the unfortunate woman not only was altogether guiltless of any share in the commission of the crime, but that she also fell a victim to the violence of the murderers. From evidence adduced at the inquest, it will be seen that the servant, Jane Toner, attended chapel on Sunday evening, and afterwards, shortly before nine o'clock, she purchased a small quantity of tea and sugar in a grocer's shop, and one of the witnesses saw her on her way homewards a short time after. A supposition founded on these circumstances is entertained by many that Miss Kerr had been slaughtered during her servant's absence, and that her murderers lay in wait for Jane Toner, and, immediately on her entering the house, struck her down with a blow from the salamander, killing her instantaneously. This theory appears probable when the police where the body was found is taken into consideration and is further strengthened by the fact that the tea and sugar which Jane Toner purchased in the town was found lying beside the body, as were also her gloves. One circumstance, however, is most mysterious, and goes far to upset the theory that the woman had just entered the house when she received her death blow. There were neither boots nor slippers found on her feet, and, strange to say, although a most rigorous search had been instituted, we understand they cannot be found in the house. The horrible idea that the murderers had actually removed the boots from the feet of their victim after having dispatched her is scarcely credible, and yet it is but in keeping with the whole conduct of the infamous perpetrators of the murders. Within the inquest, the list of the many missing items from the house is listed. The violence of the affray can be seen by the blood-spattered walls. The beds have been slept in, and the bedroom sink is filled with bloody water. Drawers are open everywhere, with papers tossed as if it would seem the murderers had searched the house thoroughly for anything valuable that they could carry. In the meantime, the police continue to search for the second suspect. A few days later, they have success. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 6th of January, 1873, the Hollywood Tragedy and the arrest of Charlotte Raw, one of the supposed murderers, identification of property. After a long and laborious search, the police have at last succeeded in finding out the lurking place of Charlotte Raw, one of the supposed murderers of Miss Isabella Kerr and Jane Toner, and putting her under arrest. The determined vigilance with which the police watched every place where it was believed she might be harboured, and the strictness and minuteness with which they carried out the visitation and examination of every house in the neighbourhood where she was recently observed, rendered it well nigh impossible that she could escape detection. Her appearance was well known to a large number of the constabulary from the fact that she was for a considerable time employed as a domestic servant opposite the police barracks in Peter's Hill. On the whole of these men were engaged in the search, the avenues leading to the streets being guarded by the police, 
while the constables were going from house to house. All their efforts had failed up till Friday evening, and the men were beginning to grow disheartened at the fruitlessness of their work and the apparent remoteness of the accomplishment of their object. They still persevered, however, and finally the casual observation of a woman which was overheard by a sub-constable was destined to bring to a termination their unpleasant duty. It was under a bed that Constable Campton found Charlotte Raw, concealed in a state of almost total nudity. Catching hold of her, he addressed her by name and told her to come out, which she did, and immediately fainted, apparently from mingled exhaustion and terror. She appeared desirous of speaking, on which the constable cautioned her, but she afterwards declared her innocence of the crime for which she was arrested. As soon as assistance could be procured, he gave her a drink, and made her attire herself in some apparel which was in the house. She was then removed to the barracks, and thence on to the central police station. On the way to the police station, the people on the street manifested great anxiety to catch a glimpse of her, and the office was surrounded by a crowd agitated by curiosity and excitement. When placed in a cell on the basement floor, she betrayed the greatest trepidation, sobbing hysterically and wringing her hands. On its being remarked to her that she was greatly altered in appearance during the last few months, she said she had been out of service for some time. M. R. Regan, solicitor, whom she knew entered the cell and she said to him in an imploring tone of voice that he would see yet that she was innocent of what she was charged with. Her appearance corresponds closely with the descriptions that have already been published. She is rather taller than the sister who was arrested before, and has a big black eyes. Of a more stouter build, she is also more masculine in appearance than her sister, and seems physically the stronger of the two, and, though possessing apparently a considerable share of firmness and determination, she does not appear to equal the other in that respect. The expression on her countenance is less daring than that of Mary, and she frequently looked on the ground while speaking as if somewhat timid and diffident. In compliance with the application of the constable, the magistrates remanded the prisoner for a week in order to enable the police to collect evidence. The prisoner was then removed to the cells. With the capture of both women, who are in fact sisters, and the absolute barbarity and forcefulness of the murders of the two women, the story remains a primary headline and makes the national papers. From the Penny Illustrated Papers, the 11th of January, 1873, scene of the Hollywood murders. We are assured by the Dublin correspondent of the Standard that nothing that has occurred in Ireland for many years in the nature of crime has created such general excitement as the murder of Miss Kerr and her servant Jane Toner at Hollywood near Belfast. The horrible barbarity of the deed, the coolness of the perpetrators, and the fact that almost to a certainty the murderers were two women make the case peculiar even in a period which such deeds are not uncommon. Mary Raw is the more strongly suspected in consequence of the discovery at the house of a woman named Hogan, where she and her sister Charlotte slept after the day of the murder. Such 
was the local determination to resolve the mystery that a large subscription for a reward was offered and added to the sum of £200 offered by the government. There is the strongest hope now that the murderers, be they two or more, will be brought to judgment. The arrest of Charlotte Raw on Saturday in a house in Belfast, where she had concealed herself under a bed, satisfies the public anger for the present. Miss Kerr's melancholy fate is deeply deplored, as, though a little peculiar in her habits, she was held in the highest esteem and respect. She was a very accomplished lady, and was possessed of high literary and scientific ability. Her father was a Unitarian clergyman of Newry, and she was related to several of the most respected inhabitants of the county. The Trial Interestingly, the prosecution decide to only charge the two sisters for the murder of Miss Kerr, believing that case to be the stronger one. The case is purely circumstantial, as no one saw the two women kill either of the two women. The sisters admit to being in the house, which they were seen leaving by two witnesses. But the women state that two men actually did the crime, and they were merely guilty of bad judgment, drink, and taking advantage of the situation by collecting goods in the house. There was also much argument by the defence regarding the line as to whether the killings were planned and premeditated, which would be a charge of murder versus the killings being due to circumstances, which would be a charge of manslaughter. This weak defence actually had some success in the hands of their brilliant defence team. The defence picked apart every proof and every witness, introducing doubt of the testimony of each witness that the prosecution introduced. In the end, the two sisters were convicted of manslaughter for the murder of Miss Kerr. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 12th of April, 1873. The Sentence, Penal Servitude for Life. Whatever persons were in the house, Miss Kerr was killed in the kitchen, and Jane Toner was killed shortly after she entered the house, and that persons who committed the crimes proceeded to ransack the house. There was evidence, no doubt, that it was committed under the influence of the liquor they had drunk. They did that which, at first sight, seems to be a most extraordinary thing for any persons to do, actually going upstairs and sleeping in the bed in the very house where the dead bodies of their victims were laid. The sentence is penal servitude for life. Mr. Justice Keogh then passed the sentence on the prisoners, and he said, Mary Raw and Charlotte Raw, after a long and careful and most anxious investigation of your case, you have both been found guilty of the crime of manslaughter. You were indicted for the crime of murder, that is, taking away the lives of your fellow creatures with malice or forethought. You had the assistance and the advantage of being defended by one of the ablest councils at the bar of Ireland. Every possible thing that could be done for your defence was done by him. Every possible suggestion that his great capacity and his singular ingenuity could put forward was advanced in your regard. After they and my learned brother addressed the jury and the whole of the facts of this momentous case, and after conferring together, we felt it to be our duty to place before the jury a view of the case, I might say a possible view of the case, which the jury appear to have adopted, and which has resulted in your being acquitted of the crime of murder 
but found guilty of the minor offence of manslaughter. The jury, in taking that view of the case, have taken indeed a merciful one. We put it before them as a possible view of the facts of the case. We did not pronounce any opinion ourselves as to the conclusion at which they should arrive. They have done so, and we see no reason to find any fault with the conclusion to which they have come. But the result of their verdict must be, as you have taken away the life of one, we pronounce no opinion as to the life of the other person whose death you were charged as being accountable in another indictment. But the result of that finding must be that each of you shall be removed for the remainder of your lives from all communication with the outer world. The justice of the country, the laws of the country, the example that is due to all the people of the country, the lesson which must be taught requires that we should pass the sentence which I now do, namely, that you should be kept in penal servitude for the rest of your natural lives. The prisoners were then removed, Charlotte rubbing her eyes as if she were about to cry. It would seem that with the conviction of penal servitude for life, the two women were not pursued for the murder of Jane Toner, the maid. They maintained their relative innocence of murder to the last. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 23rd of April, 1873, The Hollywood Murders. A central news telegram of last night says the Hollywood murderers Charlotte and Mary Raw, who were convicted of manslaughter, were yesterday removed from the county prison in Downpatrick for the transference to Mountjoy County, Dublin. Both still maintain their innocence, but admit they were in the Croft Lodge at the time of the murders. They affirm that two men committed the crime. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, The Hollywood Murders. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.